This is video 5 of Tensor Calculus. This time we'll pick up where we left off last time, only here we'll be discussing curvilinear coordinates. As before, we start by selecting an arbitrary origin, which we call point O. At this time, instead of drawing an axis through point O, we construct a ray which emanates out of point O to the right, and this we'll call a polar axis. Now, if we're trying to keep track of a point P in our space, we will construct a ray from the origin through point P to look something like this. And for completeness, we will also construct a circle through point P with O as its center to look like that. Now we need a segment that connects point O to point P, and we're ready to define our coordinate system. Our two coordinates are going to be, first of all, the distance from the origin to the point in a straight line. In this case, it's six coordinate units. And the other coordinate is going to be the angle formed between the polar axis and the segment we've constructed. So it's a two-dimensional space. We require two coordinates. And these two coordinate values uniquely define every point within the space. As I move further away, the value of r gets greater. As I move in a circle, the value of theta increases. So every point in the space is uniquely defined by a combination of r and theta. Thus, what we have defined here is what we refer to as plane polar coordinates. The word plane is included because it is a two-dimensional space. Now, similar to what we did before, we can construct a grid that looks like this, um, which has the coordinate lines for this type of coordinate system. Now, in this case, each of the circles represents a constant value of r. Everything on this circle has a value of r equals 7, here it's 6, and so on. Everything along this particular ray has a, an angle value of 30 degrees. Here it's 60, here it's 90, and so on. Well, similar to what we did for affine coordinates, we can actually scale this, um, this particular coordinate. We can't scale theta, but we can scale r. So if you notice, if I change the scale to 2, then the coordinate lines expand. And although the distance from the origin to the point is still 6 Euclidean units, the coordinate value itself is 3. And that's because we chose a scale of 2. OK, we said that any coordinate system in which all of the coordinate lines are straight is known as an affine coordinate system. Well, this obviously doesn't qualify. Some of the coordinate lines are circles, and therefore, this type of coordinate system, the plane polar coordinates, is an example of a larger class of coordinate systems known as curvilinear coordinates. This is as opposed to what we defined earlier as affine coordinates. For the next example, we move back to three-dimensional space. And as with each of the other examples, we start by creating a point O for the origin. In this case, we construct a ray vertically from point O, which we refer to as the polar axis. Then we create a plane that is perpendicular to the polar axis at point O. Looks like this. And another ray, which is located in the plane, emanating out from point O. And I hope by now you get the idea that the placement of the point O for the origin and the orientation of each of these lines is arbitrary as long as they're appropriately uh, perpendicular to each other in the right cases. So now if we want to keep track of a point P in our space, we locate the point out here in space someplace. And you can see kind of as we twirl around here that it's uh, hanging out there in space. So how do we locate this point with a set of coordinates? 
Well, let's start by constructing a plane through the polar axis that goes through point P, and it would look like this. Now we construct a little rectangular um, box on plane P by dropping segments to the base, back to the polar axis here and here. And to make it a little easier to see, we'll get rid of this plane we constructed. So you can see what we've done here is to build a little door. As I move the point, notice how the door swings. Now the segment that is dropped from point P back to the polar axis is at right angles, and this forms one of our dimensions. I use the letter rho. Some authors use the letter r. I don't like to do that because r is normally reserved for the position vector. Uh, rho is the distance from point P back to the polar axis on this segment that's at right angles. The next dimension is the height of the point above the plane we've constructed, and that is simply this segment. So the coordinate z tells us how far up we go. The coordinate rho tells us how far out we go from the polar axis. And the final coordinate is the angle that's formed at the base like this. So we now have three coordinates operating in three dimensions, of course. So you'll notice as this door swings how the angle changes. You'll notice how as the point gets closer or further away, the value of rho changes, and then as we move the point up or down, the value of z changes. This then is a system we refer to as cylindrical polar coordinates. It gets its name because if we hold the value of rho constant and allow the values of z and phi to change, then we will sweep out a cylinder like this. Thus, we refer to this system as cylindrical polar coordinates. And they are curvilinear coordinates because the coordinate lines um, in, in this cylinder are not straight lines. OK, one final example, and then we're going to be done. This is very similar to cylindrical polar coordinates. Uh, and you'll recognize this is how we started off with cylindrical polar coordinates. We constructed the polar axis, a plane, another perpendicular line, and a plane through point P. And again, as before, we'll construct a little uh, door with segments in this plane we've constructed. We drop a segment to the plane below and segments back to the polar axis like this. So far, everything is the same as with cylindrical polar coordinates. However, now we construct a segment from the origin directly to the point. And this gives us our first coordinate. It's simply the direct distance from the origin to the point. We're not measuring the distance perpendicularly back to the polar axis this time, but uh, the, the direct distance between the origin and the point. The next dimension is simply the angle between the polar axis and the newly constructed segment. And we refer to it as theta. The segment we refer to as r because this is, in fact, the distance of the position vector from origin to point p. And finally, the third dimension is the same as cylindrical polar coordinates. It's the angle phi. So here we have three coordinates. One of them is a distance, and two of them are angles. And by the way, as part of the definition, we uh, set the range of phi as uh, any value from 0 to 2 pi. On the other hand, we limit the value of theta from 0 to pi. And in that way, we remove any ambiguity about the angular location of our point. There will always be an absolutely unique combination of coordinates with this system by limiting the values this way. Let me get rid of the plane so we can see it better. OK, now as I move the point P around, again the door swings and the value of phi changes. But as I move the point closer to the polar axis, the angle theta gets smaller. And as I move it closer and downward, the value of R changes as well. 
so that those three coordinate values will uniquely identify the location of the point. We refer to this system as spherical polar coordinates. And it gets its name because if we hold the value of R constant, then our uh, surface maps out a sphere that looks like this. Okay, this concludes all the coordinate systems I wanted to show you. There are others, and I'll introduce a few along the way for instructive purposes, but these are the ones that are most commonly used. One final point I want to make is this. You'll notice that in defining each of these coordinate systems, we did not make use of the Cartesian coordinate system. Now, there's nothing special about the Cartesian coordinate system other than the fact that it's well-known and easy to use. But the fact is, each of these coordinate systems have been defined in terms of geometric objects and stand alone on their own merit. We don't need the Cartesian coordinate system to define them. All right, that's it for this video. Next time, we'll talk about coordinate transformations. See you then.